Thank you all for being here, and Anne, it's an honor to have you here. She came all the way from London. Wow. I'm a little <laughs> trouble, baby, but I'll do my best. Um, I don't know where to start. There's so much to say and so much to show. Anne has worked on 54 films as a full-fledged editor. I haven't counted. <laughs> in 64 years. It's quite remarkable. We're going to try to show a sample, just a sampling. It's the best we can do. Um, we've talked a lot about pieces we wanted to show, clips we wanted to show. And um, the awards you've received are also too numerous to mention. But for starters, I'll just say um, five Academy Award nominations, Academy Award. Um, the Academy Fellowship, which is at BAFTA's highest honor, um, the Career Achievement Award from American Cinema Editors, and um, actually last year you got the Career Achievement Award from the LA Film Critics Association, and you were the only the second editor in history, besides Dee Dee Allen, to receive that award. But I think my favorite is, um, Actually, the officer of the British Empire. Oh. That's quite impressive, isn't it? You were right, we still had an empire. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, it's interesting, because you started out as a nurse, and you also had a passion for horses, and you were thinking about being a horse trainer. So what was it about cinema? When you were a child, you went to see cinema with your father, and what was it that drew you to cinema? Well, actually, I never went to cinema as a child. My parents, and uh, you know, it was a different situation then. They thought it was a scruffy place where you've got diseases and things like that. <laughs> so we didn't really ever go. There weren't, we weren't allowed to the Saturday morning children's shows or anything like that. But when I was at school, um, at a teenage, actually, they started occasionally taking us to sort of classical films, uh, particularly books we were reading. And we were reading Wuthering Heights, which I was struggling through. And then we went to see the film, and I fell madly in love with Laurence Olivier and the cinema. <laughs> I thought, what a wonderful way to tell a story. They that it came it alive. alive for me. Was, you know, I thought, because uh, I'd always loved storytelling, and I'd been quite good at essay writing and things like that. Right. But before that, yes, I was a little horsey girl. And uh, I wanted to be a racehorse trainer. Women couldn't be in those days, actually. Yeah. Didn't have a license. Uh, I only did nursing because I couldn't get into the film industry. It was extremely difficult to get into then. You had a connection, your uncle, um, yes. Arthur Rank, who is a, a well-known producer and entrepreneur. And yes, he was more a promoter. Of, yeah. Yeah. He, made, he was very religious, and my grandfather was too. And. Uh, he made films, religious films, for sent to the churches and things like that, mostly. And then he became fascinated by it because, as we all know, it's a fascinating business. And he started making, you know, straightforward films, but always with, not a, if not a moral, but at least not ones that degraded people. Right. Think. But he, you were very passionate about wanting to be in cinema, but he didn't take you quite seriously. You well, no, no, he thought I just wanted to go in for the glamour and... I didn't. I actually wanted to make movies. So I wrote, you know, a ten-page article for him to read, which I'm sure he never did. It was all the reasons that I felt I could be a great film director. <laughs> but he eventually realised that I really wanted to do it. So he thought, well, if I put her in religious films, that'll get rid of all the glamour. So they put me in this spot in religious films where I was a projectionist and uh, made the tea, obviously, and. Uh, did sound recording and also worked in the cutting rooms and as much as we sometimes made little films, but we sent films out to churches all the time. And I used to repair them and things like that when they came back. So I had handle 35 millimeter film, which I pro think probably very few of you have anymore. <laughs> right, so you, so then the union came around. Yeah, and yes, that's right. Now I was put there partly because uh, he, even Uncle Arthur couldn't get people in the union at that time. Uh, but they, they didn't like having these little religious film companies and one or two others not unionized. So they decided to come around and unionize us. And uh, the other people didn't want to at all because they were mostly religious and doing it for moral reasons. I said, give me the form and I'll fill it in. I heard about a job by chance at Pinewood. 
applied for it, have to say, and I always say this to students, sometimes it's, you just have to exaggerate a little bit yes. because I really hadn't done any of the jobs that I was expected to do in the cutting room except to handle film and splice. So you just kind of did so a I crash did, course. Yes, I did. I went and got a cr crush course of somebody I know in, in a, a cutting room. So I, I knew a little more, but not really. I had a, a trainee under me who knew a lot more about and helped me a great deal about film. And uh, of course, I had always joined on a little hand, tiny. I don't know whether any of you ever seen those little hand splicers that you scrape put your finger on to keep it warm and join the film with cement. They've long gone out of fashion. That's splicing. But I'd only worked on those, and when I got there to Pinewood, or, you know, bright and breezy, they said the splicing's in that room, and I picked up a pile of film, and they said the splicing room is all joining room as we called it in England. It's down the corridor. I went down, opened the door, there were these hand, uh, the foot joiners which I'd never seen before, which you manipulated by pressing your toes and your heels. And I was stunned. <laughs> so, you know, because I said, oh, yes, I could just nice. Anyway, to, to cut a long story short, I mean, I tried to work it out. I was lucky I didn't take my fingers off. And then, luckily, two machines. And the guy came, one of the other assistants came and sat down in front of me. So I watched what he did. And I followed that, and I never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> and you were, um, you had some inspiration from a couple of the editors you worked for as an assistant. One of them um, was someone who said he had to go home early to tend his garden. Oh, John C. <laughs> John Seaborn. And that was good for you because you did some perfect, of the perfect for me. He was great. He taught me a huge amount, and I worked with him on several films. And uh, he would very often let me finish off a scene if he, was, as I say, he wanted to go home or he wanted to go to lunch or he wanted for any reason. He'd say, you know what, what they need here, just go and do it. And then didn't you say he was a bit hard of hearing so you had to communicate between him and the director? Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> that was helpful too. You got to learn something. Yeah, I often wrote the notes down and I don't think he ever heard them. <laughs> But that was fun. And then when he went off to do a, shoot a, second, a second unit sequence down at the racetrack, uh, and I was left in charge, just, you know, syncing up dailies and things like that. But the director, Tony Pellissier, said, um, oh, I really want that scene in the dressmaker's cut quickly. So I didn't say anything. I just kept quiet because I thought, I'm going to cut that. John's <laughs> well out, out of the way down there. So I went ahead and cut it. Tony didn't know, and he said, oh, that sequence is well cut. And they looked at me and said, how did John do it? He was down the Goodwood. I said, well, you know, he said, you shouldn't have done that, but it's, but it's really well done. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I got a few little opportunities like that, which you have to grab whenever you get the chance. You have to, have, you have to be brave, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and seize the moments. Yeah. Um, and Reggie Mills was also, you were on the set of, you watched them film The Red Shoes, which is... Quite remarkable. Well, yes, uh, it had been really exaggerated. I like to try and be slightly honest because, I, I mean, I did work on Red Shoes as much as I spliced film and often took it down to, to be viewed for dailies and used to go to dailies and listen to Mickey Powell's remarks on things and that sort of thing. But I was never really on the film. But my first film I did, uh, Mickey Powell and Emmerich Pressburg, a producer, it was called The End of the River. And a very young, very nice editor was editing it, but they didn't like his work very much, so they decided to put their top editor, Reggie Mills, onto it to pull it together. And you watched him work? Yes, because he didn't, for some reason, like the first assistant. So he said, send that second assistant up with it. So there I was, suddenly working with one of the top Reggie Mills, one of the top editors in the world, in red shoes. And it's wonderful. Yeah, it's Stairway to Heaven and all those films. But you, uh, so your very first film you edited, Pickwick Papers, was um, a bit of a challenge because the director was a first-time director, so you weren't dealing and with the greatest... he was a misogynist. He was a misogynist. <laughs> I don't know why he ever gave me the job. <laughs> <laughs> and what did he say? He didn't like this one actor, Nigel Patrick, and he said, if you said you needed a close-up, and what did he say? Well, Nigel Patrick played Mr. Jingle, who was the second lead 
was almost as important a part as Mr. Pickwick. But uh, he was quite a difficult person, Nigel Patrick. And uh, for some reason or another, they took against each other. And so, um, what's his name? The director's gone out of my head, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Noel Langley. Pardon? Noel Langley. Noel Langley, yes. Noel Langley was doing, uh, he was very inexperienced and he didn't really know what he was doing, but he was doing tight 12 shots when everybody was talking, but, the, but Mr. Jingle was talking the most. And he did close-ups of everybody else, but none of Mr. Jingle. I said, but you can't do that, no. You I mean, it doesn't make sense. I've got to cut to him to use the close-ups of the other people and things. But he said, if you want them, go and shoot them. <laughs> so there I was on my first picture, shooting the close-ups, which we used, because we had to. And I had a very helpful uh, first uh, operator on the camera, who helped me a lot with camera angles. But you also were kind of on trial there. You had two or three weeks to prove yourself. Yes, that's right. You were a little right. nervous. Yeah, well, they took, yes, no, yes, I think I was nervous a bit. Um, but I was, a, I was a feisty young person, you know? And uh, I could see what other people were doing, and I thought, I think I can do as well as that, maybe even better. So, you know, take a chance, always take a chance. And what but they did give me, yes, they gave me, told me that they'd take me on, but they would bring somebody in over me if I couldn't make out. And I didn't do too well to begin with because, you know, Noel wasn't doing too well either. And I wasn't experienced enough to give him the help that he needed, really. But then I cut a scene in a courtroom, which they really loved, and from then on I never looked back, so. What did, uh, what, how did you feel about um, you, you said that there weren't that many opportunities for women in the film industry and that editing was one opportunity. Um, how did you feel about being a woman editor? In the I never thought about it. Yeah. I, I always thought about myself as just an editor. I've always thought like that. I had three brothers and we were always brought up equally. So it never struck me that I wouldn't be treated equally. And it certainly didn't struck me that I wouldn't get the same money as everybody else. So, you know, I just went with that attitude. Mm -hmm. but, and I think on the way, you know, on the way in my career, I've had opportunities for both, I think. Sometimes they've turned me down, particularly I know Tony Richardson did, said he'd never worked with a woman. And, uh, you know, yeah. and then other people, Ronnie Neem, loved working with women. So I think there have been some of each. Right. And I think sometimes you've just... I mean, uh, uh, Muriel Box, who was very into uh, women's lib and things like that, was always talking to me about it. And I was saying, well, what were you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. It seems to be perfectly straightforward to me. I mean, you see people making big hurdles, which are not there, which yeah. women often did. Right. Later in life, I came across that. Yeah, and I mean, it's interesting, your attitude, you're very positive and believing in yourself, and then it, beca it doesn't become an obstacle for you. I think it's very, um, very impressive. Yeah, well, um, when Women in Film gave me an award, I made a speech, um, which was, I think, quite a good speech, but it was saying that I believe women made a lot of problems for themselves which didn't exist. And <laughs> the head of Women in Film said I really liked thought it was a really good speech, but I didn't agree with the thing you were saying. <laughs> but well, you don't, I, I, I think it's very interesting. Your perspective is very, very refreshing. Um, I, I um, so you were on to nine films as an editor when, um, actually Ronald Neems was one of the people that recommended you. So you were up for a, a little film that I don't know if any of you ever heard of called Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's um, a good luck way I've got that. <laughs> um, and I believe a lot of my career and everybody else's for that matter is luck. Well, I think it's, lu I think it's a combination of well, you've got opportunity, to luck, and, and then having the goods. A you have to of, have the goods. A little bit of talent to go with it. But I think so. And drive. And, and seizing opportunities when they present themselves. Yeah. Um, so can you tell the story of how you got the job on Lawrence of Arabia? <laughs> well, very quickly, because 
we, my husband and I live opposite the big store in Harrods. Which Harrods had a, is a very one, elegant department store. Yeah, <laughs> it, it had a wonderful juice bar. We did a lot of people when Nicholas Rogue used to go there. And Jerry O'Hara, who was a first AD and then became a director, he used to go there. And we met him there one day with my children, and uh, I think I only had one then. And, uh, and said, I said, what are you doing, Jerry? He said, oh, well, I'm working with David Lee. We're doing some tests for Lawrence of Arabia, um, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, as it was known then. That was the and I said, I said, well, we've got anybody, because he said, we're doing them like two little films, one when he's in the army and one when he's in, in Arab clothing. And uh, I said, well, have you got anybody, you know, cutting that? He said, I don't think so. I don't know, and I thought no more about it over the weekend. On Monday morning, the production manager calls me up and said, do you want to, to I hear from Jerry that you'd like to do this little job? So I said, yes, please. He said, well, you get 50 pounds a week, and that's it. <laughs> Which was very little money even then, because it was at least two weeks' work. Anyway, so I uh, went down, and I did know David Lean a little bit before that, but not, not really well. and. Uh, he wanted me to, this always sounds so conceited, but it's, it's quite funny. He uh, <coughs> asked me to, he said, well, the dailies, we finished the one film, which was the Arab bit, and it, he said, ha, the dailies of the other part, he said to me in front of the whole crew, have you cut that together yet? And I said, yes, I have, but I'd love to show it to you just quietly tomorrow. He said, you don't do, do quietly. Why don't we just do it now? And I said, was everybody here? I don't want them all. I, see. I was a very young editor. I said, I don't want everybody seeing it. Go and fetch it, Annie, he said, and run it at once. So I sat there absolutely terrified. And uh, he got up at the end of it and he said, that's the first piece of film I've ever seen, cut exactly the way I would do it. So it was worth running it, but I felt... Still pretty embarrassed. <laughs> but and, uh, I'll just finish that. A, yeah. a few days later, uh, he asked me to go up uh, to London with Sam Spiegel, the producer, in the Rolls Royce. And I rang my husband and I said, do you think they're going to offer me the film? They're taking me up to London in the Rolls. And, and Douglas said, well, of course they are. What else would they be? But I said, I, think so. I thought somebody else was going to do it. And yeah, they offered me the film. Very little money, and after story, I came across a letter, literally a couple of years ago, when I was turning out my one house to another and things, and it was written, Dear Mr. Spiegel, I'm afraid I can't do your film because I can't work for that little money. I know that David Lean was making a lot more money, etc., etc., at that stage, so I wish you the best of luck with your film, but no. Now, I was lucky I didn't send that letter, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have it if I'd sent it. But and I know why I didn't send it, because my husband said, no way are you sending that. I had been offered another interesting film by uh, Stanley Kubrick, Lolita. Lolita. So, I mean, I had something else I could actually do, but to turn down David Lean like that would have been so stupid. Little, you know, I was so cocky. But here was, here's the best part. Then, then he said to you, what did Sam Spiegel say? He said, well, you'll, if you do this film, the money will come. And no, he said to me, or you'll be able to ask any money you like. He said to my agent, actually, he said, uh, well, if Anne does this film, she'll be able to ask any money she likes. So about seven years later, I went back on to do the cut for television. And I knew that the only other person was Norman Savage who could have done it with working. So I asked a huge amount of money. And Sam Spiegel <laughs> said, what does she think she's doing? <laughs> and he said, you said, she works, uh, does it for that money, she can ask any money. And she's now got an Oscar, and she's one of the top editors, and she's asking that money. Good for and you. He it, and he paid it. <laughs> yes. I love that. <laughs> um, so, so this was a incredibly challenging job. You had, what did you say, 33 miles of dailies? Um, and they, they shot for a total of 15 months. They took a three-month three break between shooting in Jordan and Spain. And he didn't, David Lean actually didn't um, run dailies with you at all during that first eight months, right? He didn't, he didn't see any dailies, no. 
No, until he took the break, and then they they um, rewrote the rest of the script, and, and then you had a chance. Robert Bolt went to jail because he was one of those um, marchers down to Falco, uh, uh, anti-bomb and all that sort of thing, and he lay down in Trafalgar Square and wouldn't apologize, and so they put him in jail. But of course, he hadn't written the second half, so Sam was pretty upset. He had a whole unit standing by to shoot on and yeah. arrange for to go to Spain. Well, he apologized in the end and, and wrote it and everything, and we set off again. So we did eight months in Jordan and three months in Spain. And that's when... Four months in Spain, I think it was. And then, um, so I think what we should do is we should run the first clip, um, and then we'll talk about it. Okay. How's that sound? Sure. Thank you. A, a point I make very often, but I've never done it in connection with that piece, because you put some on the front, how long he played in that two shot. You know, there was cover, obviously. Right. But, uh, I, I just love uh, doing it now. You don't always get the opportunity, and you know, everybody's doing close ups, close ups, and close ups, and swooping cameras and stuff. But just to hold it, two wonderful actors, both playing well, I think is so effective. I, I totally agree. And I think you were talking so. Uh, about the inspiration and what you've learned learned from working with David Lean, and I think the courage not to cut is is a tremendously important yeah, I, I agree. lesson. Um, and what's <coughs> interesting, well, first of all, the famous match. I mean, this is a, arguably the most famous cut in movie history, <laughs> and it was an accident. You um, originally this was going to be a dissolve. It was not going to be a straight cut. Um, can you explain what happened? Well, we were in film in those days, so um, I think sometimes wonder if we've ever seen it the way we did if we were on digital like today, because I would have done the dissolve in the machine and we would never have seen it as a direct cut. Right. So because it was film, it was cut together with the old China graph marks on it. And we saw this, we took it in the theatre to cut, run the whole sequence, and we saw this cut together like that. And David and I both almost at the same moment looked at each other and said, that's a wonderful cut. And, leave it. and he said to me, it's not quite perfect. Take it away and make it perfect. And I literally <laughs> took two frames off the outgoing shot. And that's the way it is today. That's when we worked in frame. And of course, when something's successful, everybody wants to take credit. And Robert Bolt claimed that he wrote it that way in the screenplay. Well, which it's he, in the script with a dissolve. So how dare he say that? <laughs> I love Robert. So, <laughs> but the other thing that was interesting is that you exposed um, David Lean to a Nouvelle Vague, New Wave films, which were which really he was very excited about and taking chances in terms of jump cutting and, yeah, and direct I, cutting. I did because the French were doing such interesting things at that time, as I'm sure you know, and the Nouvelle Vague and everything. And David didn't go to the cinema very much. He lived in, we always say he lived in his Rolls Royce, but he certainly <laughs> didn't go out a lot. And so I suggested he went and had a look at them. And of course, he loved what they were doing. And I always say he did it better than they did, but I don't know about that. But he, you know, he just loved the idea. Yeah, and I think the other thing of, in terms of the courage not to cut is you were, you were nervous about how long you waited for the sun to come up. And, and just in general, taking so much time to show the beauty of the desert. And he said to you, trust it, the, wait for the music. That's right, wait to get the music. That was in some of the other mirage shots and things like that. Um, he, you know, I was always a little worried about how long we held the shots. And I don't know, it just, just seemed perfect. Yeah. We tried cutting it down once when we were doing the recon reconstruction, and it didn't work. It was, it was what it was, and you know, we put it back together again. Yeah. Um, here's another example of that. We're going to show the second clip. Those are very difficult to cut. Those scenes, actually, as anybody would would know, you know, to get the right timing on them. I never know whether it right. It always looks different every time I see it. <laughs> really weird. <laughs> but it actually there, I was thinking how sad I was that Pete had gone, because oh. we had so much fun together. He used to ride me down on his camel, <laughs> when the camel's face would come up. <laughs> <laughs> he was a bit afraid of horses, wasn't he? Hmm? He was a bit afraid of horses, wasn't he? Mm. Not him. No, no, not him, Alec Guinness. Oh, Alec Guinness, Alec Guinness. Was, right. Yeah, Alec Guinness was terrified. It's a little bit of a problem. <laughs> 
I no, it was so interesting when we were just talking about taking your time and trusting trusting the beauty of the desert and the buildup of suspense and then I it just you talk so much about how it's your own internal rhythm and it's instinctual and just feeling your way through the rhythm of the actors' performances and how it's hard to describe, but it just yeah, it's but the it feel is. you have for how to do that, to how to build the suspense and how when to cut and how long to trust that it's yeah, working. I'm just saying how really difficult that is. So it's, uh, those timings, because it's in a you know a mirage it doesn't mean you can hang on forever. And knowing, just knowing that you have, have noticed the the land um, in the mirror shots. Yeah. The, um, John Box pointed this out to me. That Can you put your mic? Oh, sorry. Pointed this out to me that they uh, put spikes of dark desert going into spikes towards the point where Ali is going to come out of the, the ground. If you look at it again, you'll see that the you know sort of dark sand oh. or little pebbles, and they've done it. Both sides are to the leading, so that your eye goes to him, which is very clever. Oh, how interesting. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and also it was interesting that the, the killing happened off screen. That was an interesting choice. <laughs> yeah. And that there was no music. And the silence was a form of suspense of its own. Yeah. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Um, I thought what was also interesting is they did a restoration in 1989 of, of Lawrence of Arabia, which you were very much involved in. And y you were all upset that they had th uh, there had been a total of 35 minutes taken out of the film. There was one one cut was done to get in more theaters and pressure from Sam Spiegel, and then there was a TV version. So you pretty much put everything back in the restoration. What was interesting, what you said is that it actually seemed longer when it was shorter because when you're not involved with a character, it feels longer. Yeah, yeah, particularly not only in that film, other films I've yeah. as well, that uh, cutting down doesn't always work. Shorter isn't always faster. But I mean, I think it was also interesting that David Lean said, you know, take, take a chance and trust and holding on moments, but he also said he was, he was good about letting things go too and, and not being if it doesn't work, let it go. And, yeah. and he was kind of, gave you a hard time a bit, didn't he? He would say, that's a stupid idea, Anne, and then he'd come back around and say, well, <laughs> I thought of it. Yeah, yeah, he sometimes did. Said, uh, you, I, you, I was very, I got braver and braver yeah. coming up with ideas and things, and sometimes he used to say they were really stupid. How could you think a thing like that? <laughs> and. Uh, I used to shrivel with embarrassment, but uh, I still kept doing it. Because he'd often say, you know what you said the other day? It's pretty stupid, but there's an idea there. <laughs> you know, you've made me think about something, and you know, it's, it, I'm so glad you said it. And it's a bit intimidating. I mean, he was a master editor himself. I was terrified. <laughs> I was started, terrified. He couldn't understand it. it was to, I, I got quite irritated him. He didn't want me yeah. you know, being cowardly like that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it was, yeah, I think, I think it was wonderful that you had that experience and, um, on, and I mean, it changed your life. That oh, film. yes, yeah. it did. Um, and what's interesting is the next film we're going to talk about is kind of the antithesis of Lawrence of Arabia because it was Beckett, which was very theatrical, not a lot of coverage. I love Beckett. Beautiful dialogue, yeah. but not, not a lot of coverage, not a, not a big, grand epic, like, no, I think if very it, different. If, if a, how well is it have been brave enough to make it into a big epic? It might have been e even more successful film than it was. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I mean, when you've got actors like Peter O'Toole and Richard Burton saying Anui lines, I mean, it was so joyous to listen to. Yeah. I used to love it. Yeah. And, um, and it was a little theatrical. And it certainly lacked space. I mean, you know, there weren't the big shots that there should be in it. Yeah. And, you know, there was when they were up on the, the soldiers were standing up on the uh, uh, on their horses, and he'd say, "Look at the soldiers on yonder hill," and then he'd say, "And, and over on here, and they'd be the same soldiers redressed, and there were about ten of them." <laughs> Because Hal Wallace didn't think those things really mattered and they cost a lot of money. 
And he also scooped you up, that. and he also hired you before Lawrence of Arabia came out because he wanted to get me cheap. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so the clip we're going to show presented a particular challenge for an editor. Um, I think we should run the clip and then we'll talk about it. Okay. And we'll explain her challenges. And there are certain things well, that. Well, most of the actors are drunk out of their minds to start with. <laughs> <laughs> Which never makes it easy, but when you've got two su superb actors like that, you can, if you work at it, you can get the right pieces, and you really doesn't know it except in a couple of places. But uh, <clears throat> it was really funny because uh, they both of them couldn't control their horses, and I remember it much more difficult than it looks. It looks as if they fairly stayed the horses, but actually they were pouncing about and they were facing the wrong direction and the boys couldn't control them. And, and then we, because of, of them not getting it right the first time, we went to a second day, and if you notice the weather's completely different. The sky the is, did skies, you notice the sunny sky side. and the dark? <laughs> yeah, and the sun was grays on the other day. And that, and, but when the two performances are so good that I don't think we really noticed those things. Yeah. And I remember when I first saw it after not having seen it for some years, when I ran it somewhere, I was surprised how quiet and do those all and the horses looked and the actors were looking in the right direction. It didn't seem that that happened at all at the time. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess it worked somehow. Well, I mean, it's I the mean, classic editing. Wonderful actors. Yeah, and it's if you're emotionally involved and yeah. the scene is working, it's amazing what you can get away I with. I found it quite emotional where he rides off today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a really powerful story yeah. because they were best friends and then they were enemies because of their, the, he was the Archbishop, Richard Burton plays the Archbishop of Canterbury. And They've just recently found some bones of his or something. I read the other right. day. Yeah. Bring so them back from somewhere. But, but he was killed in Canterbury, so I don't know where the bones would be. Yeah. I know, I read something about that. <laughs> um, but the other thing that's interesting, you said that Richard Burton was such a disciplined actor there was one scene where he had a medallion on his chest. Can you talk about well, that? I, um, and he, and he, what's it called when you um, his breath? excommunicate? He was excommunicating the king, and he was making this speech, and they had the candles all the way down. And Can you put the Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and Richard was making this really tremendous speech but in different sizes, you know, long, short, side angle, big close-ups and things, and he had this medallion on his chest, and on every take it was going, coming and going. He was so disciplined in his performance that it was exactly the same time it would happen. And uh, it's quite interesting in a way. He, yeah. he was a wonderful actor. Yeah. A couple of films with him. And I mean, it's also interesting that there is, at the end, when, when Peter O'Toole screams, the horse does like <laughs> And he probably freaked him out, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's just it's it's really. I love Beckett. I think I, it was a really rather underrated film. And you got a, a, your second Academy Award nomination for that. <laughs> yeah, that, that was, was just a, a year later. Later, so the next film we're going to talk about is uh, we're trying to find sort of contrast and, and um, sort of diversity in in some of these films um, is Murder on the Orient Express which is 1974, and Sidney Lumet is, does not shoot a lot of film. He's, can you, well, well, Sidney Lumet. Yeah. Um, he shoots very tight. Oh, yes, yeah, he knows exactly what he wants. Yeah, he camera cuts, <coughs> basically. Yeah. He's pre -con Well, yeah. the interesting thing, I think, about that film, in a way, was that to save money, because we had very expensive stars in it, was to shoot the train in one angle, of all the different interrogation scenes of the different artists, with Albert Finney interrogating them. Slightly differently, his performance was with the different artists, with the women and with the men and that sort of thing, which is quite subtle and quite interesting. But it meant that they did shot for about three or four weeks facing one way, with all the interrogation from the other actors and from Albert. And then they turned the train round over a weekend and shot the other way. And they had to remember exactly the way they played it. And 
sure Albert walked in and out of shot once or twice and so did one or two of the other actors, which they had to get perfect, but it was more the, the performances. The energy. Yes, yeah. the same energy and the way that Albert had to change his a little bit with the different people. And it saved, of course, the film millions of dollars. And this was, by the way, an Agatha Christie novel, and so um, Hercule Poirot was played by Albert Finney, and this is what we're talking about, the interrogation of all these suspects on the train. It was also interesting, and, and actually the clip we're gonna show, which is a, a climatic part of the film, um, he wanted to recreate the claustrophobia of, of being on the train and on all the suspense. And um, so they, normally they would cheat the, the walls so the cameras could move more freely. And in this case, they didn't. It was actually, um, it was shot true to the size of the, and um, this is a pretty arduous scene because it was eight minutes long. Yeah. And, um, it's funny because the first feature that Sidney Ouellette ever directed was 12 Angry Men, which and this is 12 Angry Suspects. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a similar thing of, of claustrophobia. And, and even though you didn't have a lot of co coverage for an editor, this requires very precise, it's a challenge yes. of its own. Yes. It's yeah, very sometimes it was difficult because he gave you no coverage and you just had to make the cut work. Sometimes I snuck in little extra close-ups here and there. Yeah. Which he liked, he always went with it. And, but, uh, and you also had the challenge, which could have been disruptive, but it worked really well, which you'll see in the clip, is it, there's flashbacks. Yes, to the idea of using the sort of page turn. We tried all sorts of different things. It's not like today with digital, you could try them there and then and look at them. We had to keep sending them off to the lab to try this, that, and the other. And I think we came up with quite good because it needed to be fast and uh, just to, to jog the memory of what who the person was. Yeah, and it was, so we're going to show that clip now, the final interrogation scene or part of it. <laughs> Isn't that why editors don't always <laughs> like to watch their work again? Because they're always saying... I may not have had one, but I probably should have used one. one. I could have <laughs> snuck one from somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, once I think Sean Connery was the first one that was hired, so then everyone else came on board. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, so that was quite a big budget film. The next film we're going to show a clip from had the opposite kind of situation, Aces High, which oh. is a little known film, but it's quite interesting in terms of what Anne had to work with, because this is a um, it's World War One story of. Um, it's based on the uh, First World War film called Journey's End, which was in the trenches, and this was put into the sky, but it's actually based on that story. The Royal Flying Corps. Yeah. Yeah, and so it was a limited budget, and Anne had to use library footage from other bigger budget films like Darling Lily and Red Baron and yeah. Blue Max. And it was fun to do, I have to say. And it's amazing, because we'll, we'll show a clip from a climactic battle scene, but um, dogfight scene, but uh, you had like little well, minutes. I'm sure we've seen your showing, actually. Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> it's, it's actually the big scene, part of the big scene at the end. Um, but they had little miniatures, and they had these. Yeah, these we had, that's right, we had miniatures, we had 20 foot foot planes, we had real planes, and we had all sorts of where we could find them. Blue Max, uh, the Red Baron, all those famous First World War air films. And I mean, what's interesting when you watch it, you'll, you know, because it's so beautifully edited and there's the momentum, the visual momentum and the involvement with the pilots and all that, that works editorially, you don't really notice the... I hope not. I mean, I do. I can tell now yeah. because I've I've been watching it, <coughs> um, particularly the plane spiraling down. But you you would never know. And, and in fact, Quentin Tarantino is a big fan of that movie. Yeah. I hear. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's a little known film. It's just it's just a very interesting um, example of a cha another challenge an editor faced, and oh. how beautifully you pulled it off. Malcolm McDowell said to me, "I didn't realize I went upside down." <laughs> <laughs> I did that in the cutting room. Um, so we're going to show a clip from that. This is a climactic battle scene. That's 
pretty flashy cutting right. there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you know the characters, you know, when you see them in close-up dying and things, it's more heart-rending in a way, the boy at the end. You know, it, it, I don't know if you saw the rest of the film, but you know that people have this mirage sometimes after somebody's dead, they see them. And this is part of the end of the story. It's a Malcolm McDowell who been encouraging and, and kind of helping the young boy who don't when he came out first he'd only been flying for, um, for two two weeks I think it was they were trained them in two weeks and sent them out and uh, he's sitting there you know really really sad and suddenly he sees the boy walking towards him it's very well done actually yeah and uh, but also, it's it's interesting how you know the technique of keeping yeah, keep, yeah. keeping the people alive in the battle scene, so you always know where you are and you stay emotionally involved. And then, um, yeah, you did some pretty flashy cutting there at the <laughs> end, and that was my really father <laughs> was in the RHC <laughs> in the First World War, right? And he was shot down. He had five yeah. bullet wounds on him. Yeah. So it must have been he survived long enough to produce me. So that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> We're all lucky for that. Um, so the next film we're going to talk about is um, another Academy Award nomination for you. Um, a remarkable film, Eat the Elephant Man. Oh, right. Um, very different. <laughs> very different. We have variety to that today. Um, so David Lynch, you had seen um, Eraserhead. I didn't see it. He asked me to see it. What did you think? <laughs> Which we did uh, with, some, uh, with Freddie uh, Francis, who was going to be the cameraman and I and some people from the laboratories, we were all totally about thunderstruck or whatever the word would be. I mean, <laughs> speechless by the end when we saw that because we were all quite old. Well, not old, but I mean, we weren't kids. <laughs> and it was a pretty spooky film. I don't know whether any of you saw it. I'm sure. Have you ever seen Raise a Head? <laughs> yeah, they have, yeah. So um, this is an interesting true story about Joseph Merrick. This was in the Victorian times. It was a severely deformed man who was taken in by a, surge, a remarkable surgeon who treated him humanely for the first time. Um, you were concerned, you said, before you, you worked on the film about working on a film that showed this kind of visual, but then you read the script and you were very moved by it. You, yeah, yeah, that's true. Because I was actually offered another film, much bigger, Cape, a much bigger cape kind of film. And uh, and I started reading Elephant Man and I thought, I don't think I could face that every day you know, on my close up of my movieola, because we were on movieolas in those days. And, uh, and then I read the script and I was in tears and I thought, I really must do this film. Yeah. And so um, he was uncredited, but Mel Brooks was the executive producer. And there was an issue that came up on when to actually reveal the Elephant Man. Can you talk about, so Mel Brooks wanted to reveal, to have the option to reveal the Elephant Man later rather than sooner. Yes. But you didn't have, but David Lynch did not shoot that. No, well, we went, we went, but the thing is we took the film over and, sh and Mel Brooks right at the beginning got some very bad press because they thought they were doing a send up of deformed people, which of course he wasn't. He was making a very serious film. Um, and he thought it would do the film a lot of harm if he was around. So he went back to LA while we were shooting, which wasn't the original intention. And then David and I and the very good producer we had, uh, Jonathan Sanger, would go every now and again and take cut stuff to show to Mel. And, uh, and he liked, he really enjoyed what he was seeing. and. but. Then there was a choice between the, the, when we discovered the elephant man first without his hood on, and Mel Brooks asked David Lynch to shoot it two ways. One was a, when Treves first sees him in the uh, sideshow, and a tear runs down the side of his face, and the other was when the little uh, nurse takes his supper up to the room and opens the door and drops a tray. And he asked, he said to David, you, David Lynch, I can see it now because it's so funny, really, because he said to David, I know you're a genius, David, and, but I still would like you to. You know, <laughs> David didn't bat an eyelid when he said, I know you're a genius, David. <laughs> I did. 
<laughs> anyway, so I presume we were, you know, going to shoot it both ways. But David wanted to do it um, where the uh, maid, little maid sees. No, it's the other way around. The other way around. You, yes, he wanted to see it when Treves first saw it and a tear came down his face. And so he didn't shoot it both ways. And it made it, and Mel Brooks was really pretty annoyed about that. Because, you know, he might say he was a genius, but he still expected him to do what he was asked, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so what did you have to do to, to fix that problem? So you had to blow up? Okay. Yes, yes. Well, I had to do that, but... Uh, and cut around and... What? You had to cut around things. Yes, cause, yeah, because he was in, insisting upon us um, doing it the other way round. And so we had to k take out or cut round a scene where he's feeding him... Uh, and blow up. It wasn't difficult to blow up because it's kind of grainy black and white photography anyway. Right. And uh, so we blew it up and we took him out of the side of the screen and that sort of thing on the sequence, which we're not going to see because it really was not very interesting in a way. But I managed to get round it so that we were able to not see the elephant man until the nurse sees him. Not, not do it see, with the... Uh, um, tree scene. So we're going to actually show the two. What are you showing? It we're showing the scene where he was supposed to originally see him, yeah. and the scene where the nurse sees him. Oh, well. And there was a scene in between too that where Anne had to do a lot of finessing, and you actually had to eliminate a scene or two, didn't you as well? well mostly or just cut round. Just cut round. Yeah. But we're going to show the the two scenes that we just discussed. When it's on Anthony Hopkins, rather than the emphasis being on the reveal, I think it was a good choice. Well, it was. Yeah. Mel, uh, Mel was no fool. Yeah. <laughs> he knew um, what he was doing. And, and it was interesting, you had also talked about well, the first time you saw, you actually ran dailies with John Hurt, who plays the Alpha Man, um, for, and people were just sobbing. It's when yeah. he visits the, the wife and has tea with her he's treated so humanely. Well, when he goes to a tea party. Yeah. Yeah, we're not showing that though, are we? No, we're gonna, we're gonna actually show the, the time where, when the nurse comes up. You're gonna show that now? Yeah, we're gonna show that. Maybe, yeah, better see that, I guess, yeah. before people forget what they didn't see. <laughs> Pretty dramatic, actually. <laughs> yes. If you haven't seen it before, and there's yeah. no advertising it, where you could see the elephant man, <clears throat> Did you feel that you had to be careful about showing too much just throughout the whole film? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But John made it so much his own. That, I mean, he was so wonderful, John. Yeah. And when you saw him walking about the studios with that, you would sort of help him across the road because you felt so sorry for him. Wow. It was so real the way he just made himself the elephant man. Yeah. It's beautiful, perfect trail. Yeah. If you haven't seen uh, it, you really yeah, should. Yeah, it was a tea party, but it was really nothing to do with, with that. But uh, it always, actually to this date, it always does move me. Because he says, uh, he, show, he goes to tea, and he's on his very best behavior, the elephant man, and being very polite and chatting up Mrs. Trees. And, uh, and he shows a photograph of his mother, and he says, she must have been so ashamed of me and it's just so the way he says it is so moving it must have been so hurtful for him because he wasn't so deformed when he was first born so she kind of you know loved him that yeah. is why he uh, they say that he could never have turned out to be such a charming loving person himself if he hadn't had that early love from his mother and he and was also like an educated man yes, and, a, yeah. and a sensitive man. He was treated like an animal before that. So, yeah. so it was. But she, she uh, nursed him for some months. I, th I don't think only months. I think by the time he was like a year, he was pretty deformed. And she was made to put him into a home. But she wouldn't have done. She would have probably have kept him. Yeah. No, it's, it's a beautiful film. So we're going to change the mood completely now. Yes, let's go to something funny. Oh, we are. <laughs> we're going to show a clip from What About Bob? Oh. <laughs> now, this movie was incredible, incredibly funny movie. There was a bit of problem on set between oh, the two. funny behind the set, too. <laughs> so Richard Dreyfus 
plays a psychiatrist who has a patient who shows up at his vacation home and turns out to sort of win over the family, to, much to his displeasure. And in real life, Richard Dreyfuss and Bill Murray hated each other. <laughs> to and, the uh, uh, Richard, uh, uh, Bill Murray picked up uh, a very nice producer. Uh, Laura Ziskin. Yeah, Laura Ziskin, and threw her fully clothed into the lake in the first week of shooting. And it kind of went on from that. There was always some drama. He threw a whiskey glass at Richard and, uh, you know, wh whiskey and, and broken glass shattered all over him. Luckily, he wasn't hurt. And didn't he say he refused to shoot if she was on set? Yes, well, after that, later on, he s snatched her. She thought he was going to punch her in the face, but he went like that and took her glasses off and threw them on the ground and stamped on them and said, if you ever come on the set again, I'm leaving. And so it was sort of two camps. It was, it was um, the director, yeah. Frank Oz, and Bill Murray, and then was, Richard Dreyfuss and Laura Ziskin. Yeah. And um, you also with said- the, you, With the editor in between. <laughs> and you also said the challenge was, Bill Murray likes to improvise a lot. I know you're not surprised about that, but they didn't shoot the other side of it. No, I know. I don't just think that was just, Inexperienced, oh, it can't be, you know, I mean, Frank Oz was quite experienced. It was, uh, as you would all know, I mean, if you're doing ad lib, you have to take two, have two cameras and get the re reactions to the ad lib. But I had reactions to a completely different dialogue <laughs> that I had to make into reactions to his ad lib. But in this particular scene, which is a classic scene, um, the, the dinner table scene, Fortunately, there wasn't dialogue, and the, you certainly made the most of his brilliant ad lib. Let's run the clip. He's very difficult to cut, Bill Murray. <laughs> Never does the same thing twice, ever. I mean, it, it, dinner table seats are tough anyway, aren't they? <laughs> but you definitely made the most of his brilliant improvisation. I could even see the look on his face at the very end where he's, yeah, he's yeah. amused with himself. <laughs> yep. But the, um, the film should have done better commercially, and they didn't promote it because... No, because they so hated each other. And uh, we had three different endings. The original ending was by far the best, but Frank didn't shoot it very well, I have to say. Whether that was because he had a lot of aggro from the actors, I don't honestly know, but it wasn't very good. So Bill came up with an ending, and Richard came up with an ending. And uh, actually, Richard was the best. We, we tested them with an audience and he got much the highest points. So they went with it without really stopping and thinking whether it was any better, but it yeah. really wasn't. But the of course- The original one was by far the best. Yeah. Do you remember what it was, the original ending? Uh, the original one was where they changed places and um, Bill becomes the uh, psychiatrist and uh, Richard is the patient and it's very funny. <gasps> <laughs> but it wasn't quite right. I mean, it wasn't. It was a very funny scene. It wasn't quite right, and the boys didn't play quite right. But I still liked it better than the marriage scene that we worked with in the end. Yeah, it didn't. It wasn't the same tone. It but the interesting the thing is that it's one of the only films I've ever worked on or even heard about that made more money its second week because of word of mouth. Because they didn't do very much publicity. That Disney never got. It was a Disney film. Disney never got behind it. And the boys didn't get behind it. I was at the a preview once, um, talking with Richard uh, Dreyfus, and uh, some crowd came past and said, "Oh, they are so good together, those two. I do hope they make lots of films together." And <laughs> Richard said, "Not bloody likely." <laughs> I mean, it totally worked for the parts, though. It feels yeah. very real. Richard. Dreyfus is a very funny actor, too, in a dry, different way from Bill, but uh, right. he is also. But those sound effects, I mean, <laughs> Melky. It's so a fun film to cut, actually. And I was a bit disappointed they didn't do more publicity and things. Yeah. But people enjoyed it all over the world. Well, it's a cult film, too. It, yeah. it kind of had a second life yeah. years later because it's so good. And yeah. um, um, I'm going to do a segue here. Speaking of eating, um, you had a particular challenge with an ice cream scene. Oh, <laughs> but a very different actor. Very different movie, um, wonderful movie, In the Line of Fire. 
Um, Wolfgang Peterson, wonderful director. Yes. Oh, I love working with um, Can you talk, and you, other enter, editors interviewed for this job, and, but they talked about the special effects. Yes. And you impressed him, why? Because I talked about how I loved the telephone conversations. I thought they were so good. Uh, well written, they weren't played yet, but they were beautifully written scenes. I mean, and I wasn't into the, the special effects, which they were doing some new things we were doing, which was very interesting too. Yeah, because it was, it was about someone who, who was, um, he was in love field with Kennedy, JFK, and Jackie, and he was, Clint Eastwood was Dirty Harry yeah. with the sideburns removed, put in, because yeah, he was wa guarding the president. I own him and everything. Yeah. But the cat, what, what Anne is talking about, in case you haven't seen the film, is there's this wonderful cat and mouse th um, relationship between this s so, psychopathic. I've been so John lucky in the actors I've worked with, because, you know, Clint Eastwood and John Malkovich, what yeah. Yeah, what an interesting, yeah, and their whole chemistry together and their interaction was really a very interesting part of the film. The, the scene we're going to be talking about, though, is um, it's wonderful romance between Rene Russo and Clint Eastwood. And Anne had a particular problem with... Well, yeah, well, let, let them look... Well, let's look at the clip and then we'll talk about it. Yeah. To get the best performance out of it, which was the important thing in a scene like that, it was very complicated, and uh, I see one or two little slips there, but I don't think, hopefully, the audience kind of notices. But uh, it was fun to cut because, uh, you know, Clint is another actor that, in a different way from uh, Bill Murray, but he often doesn't do the same thing twice, and uh, doesn't play the scene the same way twice. Doesn't learn his lines till the morning? Is that mm. what she said? He doesn't really learn his lines till the very last? No, no, he never does. Because they, at the beginning of this film, they said, let's come up, um, Wolfgang said, you know, let's come and rehearse. Oh, no, said Clint. I'm not doing any rehearsing. I'll, uh, I'll come in in the morning and we'll run through it and then we'll shoot it. And that's what we did. And you get a lot of compliments about, actually, the timing of her looking <laughs> back. And, and to you, it, was a, it wasn't a difficult thing at all after doing the ice cream thing. This was well, yes, but I, <laughs> uh, you know, I spent a little time thinking about it. And so, what, again, an inherent rhythm and yeah, just... Yeah, so it's something you can't explain. And I just, I never changed it, I don't think. I, I think I more or less did it like that and stuck, you know, did it several times and then left it. Yeah. It didn't go back ever. So Wolfgang Peterson said about Anne, she is totally and absolutely powerful and so much enthusiasm about editing and filmmaking. I have to say, this is rewinding a little, in 1972, Carol Reed, um, who's a brilliant director, Anne did his last film, she said, I worked with many really good editors, you're the one with the most heart. That's my favorite. That's my favorite of anybody ever said to me. And then John Ford said, if she's good enough for David Lean, she's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one too. I have to say, he was lying in his bed in his dressing gown at that moment with food <laughs> spattered down the front of him. <laughs> so there's another good quote which, from you where you said, stretch me to a certain wonderful director, Steven Soderbergh. Steven Soderbergh, yeah. Um, and this was in, on, in a one, an incredible movie and a, a very famous scene that we're going to show, um, Out of Sight, 1998. Um, you got another Academy Award nomination for that. And you were very intrigued by it. You knew he liked to try things and experiment in the cutting room. You were looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, I, I was. We did try things. It's interesting in Out of Sight, actually, because there's quite a lot of um, interesting editing in it now, but we did a lot more. We even had another prison scene and uh, in an, another prison, which was totally confusing, but uh, we read several interesting things with scenes, and then I said to Stephen one day, I think we've overdone it. We've made the whole film really tricksy, and so we simplified it. We took out the prison and we took out some other of somewhat tricksy scenes that we'd done and just left some of them in. And uh, I think it worked pretty well, really. Yeah, it's interesting. Those, people always ask about the little uh, freeze frames that mm -hmm. we, 
which is again something you can't explain. It started off by we were freeze framing when we introduced a new character, right. and and then it went on. We started experimenting. I can't remember if it was Stephen or me who started using it in different places, and I put one in where he's just about to seduce her on the, on the bed, just about the day before we cut the negative. Wow. Because I suddenly felt we needed just one more. And it's just sort of an erotic, beautiful yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and this is the story, I mean, it's, it's very, Elmore Leonard is a very specific kind of, there's a musicality to his dialogue, yeah. and there's a rhythm, and you talk a lot in your editing about the rhythm of actors interacting, and there's, yeah. so this is a lot of beautiful stuff to work with, this language. I sometimes show, I haven't brought it with me this time because it's in Los Angeles, but I cut the two scenes completely separately. I cut the one in the bar with, all the way through the dialogue, and then I cut the one in the bedroom with silent, with just music that I put on it. Because uh, the original plan was? To put da da a dialogue from the bar scene over the, lo the uh, love scene or the scene. So there was the never going to be dialogue in the second scene. We're but talking. It wasn't, wasn't going to be intercut like that. But we got the idea and we started experimenting and we had a really good time doing it. He'd say, you know, to overlay that dialogue there and I'd say, well, this, this hand bit here and, you know, we did, uh, and we, and I think with those scenes, this is very often true. You get it pretty well right the first time. I mean, you obviously go back and do little titivations and things, but basically, if you don't get those very difficult scenes right the first time, you just get wronger and wronger, if you know Yeah, what I mean. no, exactly. Um, so we should show this scene. Um, so basically, this is a story of a pretty unsuccessful bank robber, and she is a US Marshal who they meet in the trunk of a car when he's escaping from prison, and there's this sort of, is she gonna try to arrest him, or is she gonna try to sleep with him? And there's this whole back and forth. And this is, um, this is a scene that has been talked about a great deal. It's pretty remarkable. An hour and 19 minutes into the film. Well, you, I think you see in George's lines here, what, you know, that's interesting, that the, what the story is really about is when he's talking to her. Right, and, it, and you get in, and what's interesting about the way it's cut is you get more inside their heads. Yeah. And it, you're, you're more involved because of, it's not just stylistic, it's like style is, content in this case, and I think it's a really good example of that. You had an interesting moment where you were, you switched from um, Lightworks to Avid, and you were talking to George Clooney, and were, you were saying, well, they're all just tools, and... Yeah, know. well, yeah, George and I've always been friends, ever since I said this remark to him, because I was changing from Lightworks, it was quite difficult at my age, and and one thing or another for me to go from film to um, digital. Uh, I had lessons, and uh, there's a, a friend of mine who is my assistant, thinks I learned all wrong anyway, but uh, I had a lot of teaching and uh, then went off and did it my way anyway, and kicked the machine a lot and things. I was just not into digital. But one day I realized that, you know, all one was doing was telling a story, in a different way with different tools that, uh, you know, that you were <coughs> just making it more exciting or more dramatic or funnier or whatever, and uh, saving the actors' performances. And this is what I said to George. And I didn't really know him because we'd only just started on the film, but uh, we were chatting and I said, he was saying how, how he would never get married and never have children. Well, he doesn't look as if he's having children, but he is certainly married. So um, he said, instead of children, he had a pig. <laughs> he did. But he said to Jennifer Lopez. But then, yes, I've gone on with the story because she, I said that to him, and he thought it was very funny, and as I say, we're still good friends. And Jennifer was just coming up, who was not the nice Jennifer she is now. She was pretty bitchy then, actually, <laughs> I have to say. Well, she wrote, uh, when I say that, I mean, she wrote in the paper, now that George Clooney's acting with me, maybe he'll become a star. And in another time, he wrote about Steven Soderbergh. They asked about his direction, and she said, what direction? So, I mean, if that isn't bitchy, what is? <laughs> but she's much nicer now. But uh, anyway, George said to her, this is the editor who's going to save your performance. 
And she didn't think it was at all funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, it was interesting when you were talking about, because um, you have the perspective of going from Moviola to digital, and you, you said something which I thought was so interesting. It's like editing from the inside out. Well, yes, it's I, versus it outside sounds in. Sounds a kind of clever, clever thing to say, really. But it, if you think about it, it uh, it makes sense because with on a moviola, you have the bits se are separate, so you take them from. You've probably got them on a rail where you're going to put them in the moviola or the avid or whatever, the um, Steenbeck or whatever you're cutting on. And so you're coming from the inside out, as it were. But with your cutting on uh, digital, you've got it all together. And so you're cutting from the outside in. It's an interesting way of describing yeah. it. Yeah. It was difficult to me to work on the Avid for one reason, uh, was that you're sitting so back. Um, I cut a lot on... I always did my first cuts on the Moviola. I ran on Steenbeck's and... Uh, other things later on with the director, but I loved being cl up close with my moviola, just me. Nobody else could look over yeah. my shoulders or anything. It was just a, per a personal thing, which it is to me very much a personal thing, and it worked well. So it was difficult to suddenly be sitting back with three screens in front of you. And, you know, I, uh, I didn't think I'd ever make it, but I think I probably have. I think you Luckily. do. I think you do fine with challenges, Anne. <laughs> um, um, how are we doing with time, Josh, Jason? Or should we watch show on Faithful or start Q and A? Pardon me. Do we have time for? You want to see Unfaithful? Okay. What? How much? Unfaithful. We're going to oh, show. Right. Right. So Unfaithful was a. It, 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 this was this was more problematic. This situation because you had a sex scene. Can you talk about Adrian Lyne, who oh, right, the Adrian roller coaster Lyne. director? Yeah. Well, we had a sex scene. A sex scene that uh, I think we're going to play, which um, <laughs> wasn't really working that well. And uh, so I went and talked to Adrian, who liked to talk about scenes actually, but he was fairly busy at the time and. Uh, he said, well, just go ahead and see what you can do with what you can make of it. Just try, try, try anything, you know. So I went and did the cut, you'll see, where I cut her in the train into the lap scene. And it's so much more powerful because you're, you're feeling her emotions as the love scene oh, yes, is happening. Yes. And I only had, I think it was three takes of her. And so I didn't have that many looks. I mean, there isn't a, a frame that you could use that I haven't used in it, actually. And when he went to look for outtakes, there was nothing there. No, said. that's right, because Adrian always liked to, you know, have a look at what wasn't there, just in case I'd missed something really good. But there was no, nothing there of her. And the problem was he really didn't have a way to start the scene, and he talked through it, didn't he do? The, I mean, the love scene itself was problematic because he, he didn't have a real start to it. Was that? No, I don't remember that, but maybe. It just, it just didn't sure. work. Yes, yeah. Um, and it really, I mean, it's probably the best thing Diane Lane has ever done. You're really involved in her, all the complicated emotions that she feels. Yes, yeah. So we'll show the scene. We just tighten the emotion as what was happening, which wasn't quite working as a love scene. Right. Her um, remembrances and her feelings and emotions, which they were. Is what really makes it, it powerful. Yeah, it was fun to do. And, and luckily, because Adrian can be quite difficult, but he loved it right from the beginning. He thought it worked really well. It did. He used to show it to people because he, he was so proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> and you did it, Anne. We'll run the clip now. That's why they chose me to cut Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting quite a reputation, <laughs> Anne. <laughs> No, I mean, it's so powerful because there's so many different emotions on yeah. her face, and it yeah. makes you involved with she her. She was so good in this. She was so but good. A lot of it was Adrian. He really worked with her, really, really worked with her. Yeah. Had her in tears, and you know, not in this scene particularly, but generally without the film, he would go over and over four or five times in one take until she broke down, and he got a really good performance from her. Right. Um, no, it's be but it's beautifully edited, it really is. <laughs> I think, I think some people might want to ask you some questions. So we're going to take some Q&A from the audience. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you. That's a nice photograph. Where did you get it from? I look so young. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. This was no. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Without, without you, I couldn't have done it. Thank you so much. Um, questions from the audience? Yes, over there. Um, so we have all learned a lot from you, watching you and the work that you've done. Uh, is there anybody that's coming out today that you feel like is particularly inspiring or you're moved by their edits and what's coming out right now? Any editors that inspire you? Uh, Yes, uh, Jack Harris, Andrew G. Mills. How about editors today? Any particular editors that you're? The future. A future, the future. For the future. <laughs> yeah, my daughter. Her daughter. She has created a cottage industry, by the way. She has three children, two directors and an editor. <laughs> <laughs> but my daughter is a wonderful editor. She always said she'd never fo follow in her mother's footsteps but then somehow she fell into them. <laughs> and she just cut a, a film with uh, Jennifer Garner called uh, Angels in Heaven, which made a lot of money. And uh, she's, all, she's uh, done some re really interesting films. I love when she asked you what your style was. And you said, I don't have a style. And you said, yes, she said, what did she say That's to you? right. <laughs> Years ago, this is. She said to me, what's your sort of editing style, mom? I said, well, I like to feel I don't have, you know, being sort of thick. Yeah, I don't have a style. I like to feel I bring different things to different films. Oh, yes, I, you do, she said, because we're studying them at university. <laughs> <laughs> that was a put down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little deaf. Um, how do you go about you, you're you're you're, t you're sort of living in the roles of other people who are part of the film? Is that your question? And yeah, like with with music and and with performance and your your being a conduit. probably I can't probably answer this. It sounds really complicated. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what... I, I haven't quite got what you're saying. <laughs> it's my fault because I'm a little bit deaf. How, how, do you, uh, how do you combine all those different elements from the other people that you're collaborating with and their sort of sensibilities? Ah, uh, you're going to have a... Uh, so uh, how, how do you work with all the other disciplines that are involved? Because like the editor is you're combining everything together, the, all these other raw elements that other artists and technicians have created. How, how do you switch between and, and understand all those different parts to create one thing? I don't quite know how I do that, actually. I, I get it's instinctive because I don't... You know, I work very closely with, I suppose you mean cameramen and sound, and uh, particularly with the uh, production designers and that kind of thing, and what, because uh, they're all contributing. I mean, editors now very much consider ourselves to be storytellers, which we've always been, but it hasn't been recognized so much as it is now. And I think all, everybody is working, generally speaking, to try and tell that story in, in their own way. Like I said, John uh, Box on Lawrence, uh, when. It, Ali's coming out would put dark patches if you ever see it again. Have a look, because it's quite interesting. It's not noticeable, but it is, because it helps your eye. So, you know, I would, he would have told me about that and we would have discussed it. But I don't know whether that's what you... But it's also, I mean, I think one of the things you talk about is, you know, getting to know the material really went well and living with all these elements in the cutting room and then, and then taking something that's inside of you and making it work but yeah. sort of but but I, but I like to work very closely with the director if possible 
a few idiots I've worked with, I'd rather not. <laughs> but generally speaking, I've been very lucky and worked with really interesting directors. And I like to talk to them. Some of them are not. No, 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 not that they don't want to talk to you, but they, don't, they find it themselves quite difficult to talk to you about what they're looking for. I mean, I don't like a director particularly telling me exactly what to do, but to, what he's aiming for so that I can enhance that I like working with. And I also do always get to know the cameraman and, the, and uh, you know, the rest of the crew and discuss it over a drink or two here and there, which is... Uh, I don't know whether that answers you quite, because I don't really... It's so difficult to explain where you get your ideas and your emotions and things from. I just want to say one thing that I forgot to mention, because I think it's so important, because this is an audience mostly of editors, and every editor I've interviewed, nobody maybe of your caliber, but close, master editors, um, everybody has those moments of doubt, no matter how brilliant and how successful you are, and you too have said, you can often start a film and say, oh God, I've lost my touch. <laughs> and have self-doubt, no matter how experienced and no matter how successful you are. And you always think you're never going to work again. <laughs> so, <laughs> if the phone it's doesn't amazing. always go every minute of the day, you're never going to work again. So I, I think, sure and laugh like that, always. But I think it's very good for the audience to hear because it's part of being an artist and questioning yourself and I think that's just a beautiful thing and I think it's yeah. it's fine and then you say you cut a few scenes and then you're in it again. And Usually that's what happens yes you cut a particular scene and it kind of works and it's got a magic to it and it gives you all your confidence back again because I think a lot of editors have a little, not a lot of confidence always. It's tough. It's tough because yeah. you're you're an underappreciated. You, you know what you're doing and thinking and things is right out there for everybody to see. Yeah, and you're the end of the line too. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I wonder if, in light of the earlier panel, you could comment because obviously you have an incredible perspective on what's happening in television and now streaming services today that these things have sort of turned into the new cinema in a lot of ways, and, in, and yet in other ways. Like I always find when I'm watching these things, it's, it's kind of cinema, it's kind of not, right? Like, and as they were saying in the earlier panel, now we have these 60-hour movies and things like this coming out. I mean, what is, do you have any comment or reflection on what gets lost or what might get gained and, and this new sort of venue, I guess? <clears throat> Being Netflix, House of Cards. Streaming and watching it. People streaming and watching hours and hours of, of TV shows. I don't know if you have an opinion about that. I didn't know they did. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm a good answer. There's someone way back there. I don't know if there's a well, line. I didn't answer him very well. I must be able to do better than that. Well. But I don't quite know what, since I didn't know about that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we also did, she didn't see the panel, so I'm not sure. I, it's a... I don't know a great deal about television, but I do think nowadays a lot of it is a lot more interesting than the films they're making. Yeah. I think Jodie Foster said that the other day, and I absolutely agree with her. I mean, yeah. when I first... When, we, when television first came in, you know, everybody sneered at it a bit. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, even in those days, there were very interesting things done on television. Well, it can be, they can take more chances, and they're director, auteur-driven, and writer-driven, yeah. and really interesting, yeah. intimate stories that can be told. There's so much of a, you know, I mean, I'm not into all that uh, winged things and... And what's it, what are they called, the, the things that look like one thing and then you change them and they look like something else? Transformers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I'm not into too much of all that. You like, you like people stories. Yeah, I like people stories, yes. But I, and I think that, I mean, there's lots of room for them, but there seem to be just too many of them Yeah. right now. And so I would rather watch television very often. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I, had a, I have a question, I guess, since I have the microphone. Um, <laughs> um, 
Thank you, Anne. Um, Lawrence of Arabia, I know I speak for many people when I say Lawrence of Arabia is one of my favorite films of all time. Um, and I just wondered, after dozens and dozens of films um, and I, 64 years of experience, what, if anything, you would want to tell yourself, if, um, you know, your, your, yourself when you were just starting out as an editor? Oh, what would you tell your, that's a good question. Um, what would you tell yourself now if you were just starting out as, as an editor based on what you've learned all these years? I don't think I'd be able to do it. It's much too technical nowadays for me. No, but what would you tell yourself in terms of wisdom, what you've learned? Like if you could speak to yourself as a young person, having, having gone through all the things you've gone through and, and the wisdom of your experience, what, what would you tell yourself that would be helpful? I don't know that I would change anything a, a huge amount. That's I mean, I've been pretty great. I think I've been very, very lucky. I don't. I, I really believe that. I'm not minimizing myself or anything. I do think I've had a lot of luck, and maybe I've had a little talent which goes with it. Maybe. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I I do think to be in the right place at the right time is very important in this business, and then having the foresight or whatever it is to, t to take that opportunity. Take I the reins. I try to explain to people that sometimes just stepping stones. I mean, when I was a first assistant, I went back to a second to keep working because there was so little work about. I would rather have kept working as a second than not have worked. Right. And it paid off because when, the, you know, they got going again, I was in a good position to fly back up to first. Yeah. And pad your resume, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Pad your resume, you know? <laughs> Just, yeah. um... But I don't know what advice I'd give myself. I've, I've, I mean, sometimes I think I would like to have been a director, but, you know, I had three children and, and a husband, and uh, I just think it's too much to direct. That's what stopped me to begin with. I went in wanting to be a director. That's why you went into the cutting room, because... Yes, yeah, yeah. and uh, cutting seemed like the most interesting path to follow. I really didn't know what a cutter was or an editor when I first thought I'd like to be one. <laughs> yeah. But I just know that David Lean and a lot of the Ealing, Charlie Crichton and Charlie Friend and people like that had all come from the editing room, so it must be interesting. And then once I did it, I fell in love with it, and I yeah. still am. I'm actually dabbling now in producing for various reasons, <coughs> one of them being my back. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, and you know, uh, I'm getting older, I guess. So, you know. But you're very young in spirit. Yes, yeah, so I'm dabbling <laughs> in producing. I've got a couple of films that are going ahead a little bit. We've just cast Antonio Banderas in one of them. And so, but I actually love cutting, and my uh, idea is to put an editor on uh, who I'll supervise a little bit. But also, when there's a nice scene come up, I'll just edge him. <laughs> <laughs> and and they are happy, happily sitting at my abbey. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. You'll have a chance to talk to Anne after this. Thank you. Thank you very much.